Welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study at Oxford Bible Church. I'm Derek Walker, the pastor, and we are going through uh, the Gospel of Mark right now. Last week we covered the first half of Mark, chapter 4, the parable of the sower, and um, this week we're going to pick, pick up from verse 21 and uh, really continue what we, we began last week. So let us uh, start with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your life and your teaching. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will, you will bring it to life for us, that we would understand the kingdom of God and, and how it operates in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, we are looking at one of the major days in Jesus' life. In fact, to get more information really on this day, you would need to look at Matthew chapter 12 and 13. Um, but what basically what happens on this day is that Jesus had done an outstanding miracle, which was what a proof uh, casting out of a dumb spirit, and that was a proof that he was the Messiah. In response, the Jewish leaders had to come up with a reason why he couldn't possibly be the Messiah, despite this miracle. They never denied his miracles, um, because they knew they were real. And so they come up with the explanation that he was possessed by, by, the, uh, by Beelzebub, by Satan. And at this point... The, Jew, the, the Jewish rejection of Jesus was sufficiently clear that it was uh, clear that the kingdom of God, the messianic kingdom, uh, would not come to pass at that time. In other words, it would be postponed. Uh, and instead, what was going to happen is what we now know as the church age. And so, because Israel rejected the kingdom, the this kingdom age will be postponed and instead would be what's called the mystery kingdom this is a phase of the kingdom of god on earth that was hidden in god from the foundation of the world god kept it at his secret uh, because it did depend on the jewish rejection and so god respects free will he knew it would happen but he he couldn't announce that ahead of time and so now Jesus begins to reveal through parables what it will be like in this mystery kingdom, in this church age. And um, it would be a whole period of time that is described by the parable of the sower and also the, the wheat and the tares, in which the kingdom of God would actually operate through the sowing of the word of God. And um, But Satan would also be active doing his own... Uh, counter sowing and ultimately um, it will extend over a period of time and then there will be a great harvest um, at the, the end of the, the end of the age will be the harvest according to Matthew 13 so he he outlined the whole program for this age now he, we can see it on the macro level, we can, but we can also apply these principles personally for our lives. And in the parable of the sower, the agent of change, the agent of the kingdom of God is the word of God. The power is in the word. But we have a responsibility too, because the, what the word produces in our lives depends on the soil. And so Jesus described the different kinds of soil some good soil, some bad, not so good soil. And depending on the kind of soil, um, you know, you get different kinds of fruit. And so the soil has no power to produce fruit. The power is in the seed, in the word of God. But we have a responsibility to get our hearts into good condition, good soil, so that the word of God can produce the fruit in our life. So we're, we are now going to just, having completed the parable of the sower uh, in up to verse 20, we're going to start our reading in verse 21, and we're going to read to the end of the chapter, and um, this will include, you know, further thoughts that, that come forth from the parable of the sower, and then we're going to see Jesus training his disciples by by, by an on-the-job situation, by putting it into action. All right, so let's start our reading at Mark 4, 21. And he said to them, 
Is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden which shall not be revealed, nor is, has anything been kept secret but that it should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And then he said to them, Take heed what you hear. Um, with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you, and to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. But to whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, and should sleep by night, and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. Then he said, To what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when it's sown on the ground, is smaller than all the seeds on earth. But when it's sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches, so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. And with many such parables he spoke the word to them, as they were able to hear it. But without a parable he did not speak to them. And when they were al alone, he explained all things to his disciples. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace! Be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said to one another, Who can this be, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Praise God. Well, we uh, let's go back now to verse 31, and again, he is given that what he considers the primary parable of the kingdom of the of the centrality of the word of god you you know jesus did many miracles and they are highlighted in mark and miracles and healings are exciting but jesus put his main emphasis on preaching and teaching because he knew it's the word of god that produces permanent change and and i just wanted to add a little extra thought to to what i shared with you last time uh now as he's applying the, the parable of the sower. And in verse 21, we're going to talk about the lamps of those times, which were all based on the, on the olive lamp. Let's, let's just read that. Uh, verse 21, a lamp is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed. Is it not set on a lampstand? And, and what he is saying here, he's talking about the fact that uh, since the power is in the word, um, we are to be lights of the world. We, he says, since the kingdom operates by sowing the word, he he's really saying it's important that we that we sow the word, that we share the word of God with other people, that we share the gospel, because that's how the kingdom spreads. Only he uses the analogy of a light. We're going to look at a oil lamp now, and. Um, and, and, and show how this shows a picture. And what he's saying is, the whole purpose of a lamp is that it should shine the light. You don't hide it away, do you? You put it in a place where that light sh can shine. That's the whole purpose of a lamp. And, and what I've realized is that, uh, today that he is saying that we are that lamp. We are the light of the world. And and when we look at the lamps they had in those days of course they didn't have electricity. The lamp that you can see right now is is like a very basic oil lamp and we could think of it as as having three parts. There's the clay vessel which is the 
um, like our bodies. Okay, then the oil, the olive oil, which was in the uh, sitting inside the container, that's a picture of the Holy Spirit, who's in our spirit, and at the s connecting those two is the wick. Okay, and think of the wick as your soul and, and or your heart. So the wick is to be dipped into the Holy Spirit, into the oil, and the wick comes out through the mouth the mouth of the clay vessel. So we are um, designed, as it were, a spirit, soul, body, and the soul is to take the oil of the spirit and transmit that anointing through our mouth, through our lips. And so what, when that thing is lit, lit up, praise God, then the oil fuels the fire and the light shines. And in the same way, when we, we are, are trusting in the Holy Spirit and we start sharing the good news of Jesus, um, we open our mouth, as it were, then the oil of the Holy Spirit empowers our words and we shine like a light. The light of God shines as we share the word of God. And throughout scripture, you, you shine by your words. Your words release the power. The power's in the oil, but you release that power when you speak out God's words. And so that's what he's saying in verse 21. He's saying, you know, you are a lamp and you're not to hide your light. You are to whatever position God gives you, whatever location God gives you, you, you are to shine that light. You're not to hide it. You, you are to sow the seed wherever you can. All right, we're going to move on now. And the verse 22 is an encouragement uh, about, again, the, the, the God's kingdom works through the word. And what he's really saying in the parable of the sower is, if you get the word in the heart, if you get it planted, and you, and you keep the heart good, then that will definitely produce fruit. It, you may have to be patient because it takes time for the plant to grow, all right? But you can be confident that the word of God in you will produce the fruit. It will produce the results. And he says that another way in verse 22. For there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. If you hide the word of God in your heart, it will be manifested in your life. It will produce good fruit in your life. It will produce health in your life. It will produce strength in your life. It will produce wisdom in your life. Because if you hide it in your heart, it will be revealed. That's what Jesus is saying. Have confidence in the word of God. Nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. Praise God. Uh, and so he's, he's promising. Have confidence in the word of God. God's word will deliver the results to you. And then his big conclusion of the parable of the sower, verse 23, if anyone has ears to hear, literally, let him hear and keep on hearing. In other words, the key to the whole thing is keep on hearing the word of God. Get it in your heart and that will produce the, the results in your life. The, the kingdom of God will be produced in your life. And as you share the word, the kingdom of God will spread to others. And then he said in verse 24, and this is really just revising again what we did last time, take heed what you hear. In other words, make sure you are hearing the word of God because Satan also has his word. Uh, the world has a, has a different philosophy. And so there's, there's many voices in the world. So be careful what you're giving your attention to. And then he says, with the same measure of attention, of hearing that you use, it will be measured to you. The results will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. So again, he's saying what the, from the parable of the sower, the application is the more attention, the more value you give to the word of God, the more results will be in your life. Like Jesus said, some 30, some 60, some 100. You determine the results. The seed is the same. But the results are determined by, by the quality of the soil, by how much value and attention you give to the word of God. For whoever has, verse 25, whoever has ears to hear, to him more, more fruit, more results will be given. 
But whoever does not have ears to hear God's word, even what he has will be taken away from him by the enemy. The enemy will be able to steal whatever spiritual progress you make if you, if you stop giving attention to the word of God. All right, so now we're heading into new territory, I think, in verse 26. And now he tells a parable here that is only here in Mark's gospel, nowhere else. But it's still obviously on the same theme. It says, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. Verse 27, and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. Now, what is, what is Jesus saying here? He's comparing the spiritual dynamics to what it's like for, for a farmer or anyone who's planting seed. And, and what this is telling us, first of all, is that the kingdom of God, again, works through the seed of the word of God. But it says that once he's sown the seed, he doesn't do anything else to, to make that seed come to pass. All right. It, 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 it literally he goes to sleep. He, he you know, he does his stuff during the day. But the seed, as it were, is, is growing on its own. Uh, let me continue to read that. He doesn't know how. For the earth yields, verse 28, for the earth yields crops by itself. The earth yields crops by itself. And that's where the word by itself is the word automatically. And uh, this is, what this means is there is no visible cause for this seed to grow. This seed which is the seed of God's word working in, in people's hearts. You know, when you share the gospel, for example, your responsibility is to sow the seed. All right. And then you, you leave it to God and he will bring about the growth. What this is saying is that seed grows by itself. You plant it and, and really you can't do anything else now. You, you have to trust the Holy Spirit to give the growth of that seed or you get the word in your heart and it's the seed has the power in itself to grow and produce fruit all right the emphasis is that this man once he's sown the seed he 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 goes to sleep he does his work but he he, he can't do anything you know to make that seed happen and what this is saying is we cannot produce the results in our own strength or by our own efforts it's the power of the seed the seed has the power within itself to produce the results. Our responsibility is to sow the seed into our hearts uh, or into other people's hearts and keep our soil, good soil, in good condition. But the actual power of God to produce the results is, is in the seed. And when it says the earth yields cropped by itself, it could be translated without visible cause without human agency and and really what what it's saying is it's god it's god that does it in fact 1 corinthians uh 3 6 um uh, paul comes to the same conclusion you know he says that um i i planted apollos watered but god gave the increase god gives the growth all right. So that's in, in, when you pl sow the seed of the gospel into somebody's heart, you relax because you've done what you can do. Now it's God that must give the growth. All right. The power's in the word to bring th the results to pass. Hallelujah. And, and, and so it doesn't depend on your human effort. It's the word of God has the power within itself to produce. And that should be encouraging. We need to get the word in our heart, but the word will cause the change that in our life. Praise God. And, and then he, 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 so that's the confidence we should have in the word of God. That if we get the word in our heart, it will produce the results. And, and, but it doesn't do it all at once. Notice it's a process of growth. It takes time. Somebody said it's seed, time, and harvest. You know, seed, that's the sowing of the seed. Then there's time while the seed is growing. 
and then there's the harvest, which is when the seed comes into full manifestation. It's a process, so it requires patience. Confidence in the seed and patience because this is a process that takes time. And for for some of the time, the seed is under the ground; it's invisible, and only you, but you know by faith that it's there, and that it's growing and working, and you're trusting in God's Holy Spirit to to cause that to produce the results. You plant the seed of healing in your heart, the word of healing, and you just trust that God is going to cause that to grow and produce results. And notice the process in verse twenty-eight. The earth yields the crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, and then also then the full grain in the head. First of all, the blade comes above the ground, then the head that contains the grain is is like a protective sheaf around the grain, and then finally all the grains come into the head. And so it's a process. And then he says in verse 29, but when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because harvest has come. The harvest is when what the seed comes into its full manifestation. That's the purpose of the seed. It's amazing that within this tiny seed is all the potentialities of the full manifestation. And you know, you were once a tiny seed in, in the womb of your mother. And it's amazing that from that potentiality, under the right conditions, you grow you grew and, until you become a full-grown adult. That's the growth of a seed. And that's how God, God's kingdom works. Get the word in your heart and that seed, that seed will grow. And, and it's also, I just want to go to 1 John 3, 9. Now, first of all, I want to go to 1 Peter 1, 23. Because this picture of a seed applies to us. In a sense, we can think of ourselves as this plant. We were born again by the word of God, by the seed of God. And the seed of God was planted in us and we became a new creation. And think of yourself as that plant that comes from the seed of God himself. 1 Peter one twenty three um, uses that language. 1 Peter one twenty three find it here we are having been born again your spirit was born again not of corruptible seed but incorruptible through the word of god which lives and abides forever and in verse 25 he says this word of the lord um, is the gospel preached to you so now go to 1 john chapter 3 um verse 9 1 John chapter 3 verse 9 and th this is an exciting verse too you are born again by that seed so God planted that seed in you your spirit came to life you are like this new plant of God and then in 1 John 3 9 it says whoever has been born of God does not sin now we might think that's a bit funny I still um, the sin as a Christian, you know. Um, but what it's saying is, your spirit, which has been born of God, is perfect and does not sin because it has the DNA of the Lord. And so in your spirit, your spirit doesn't generate sin. Yes, your flesh may generate sin, but your spirit does not sin. Hallelujah. Why not? For his seed remains in him. Praise God. You have the seed of the word of God. Now you are that new creation in your spirit. You, and he cannot sin, it says, because he has been born of God. And what's happening right now is that seed is growing. That seed of divine life in you is growing. And, and, and bit by bit through the Holy Spirit is, is manifesting more and more in your soul. And one day it's harvest time. And at harvest time is when that seed comes into its full manifestation. You come into your full manifestation as a son of God. And that will happen at your glorification, at your resurrection. Your, your whole body will, will radiate the glory of God because that seed of divine life inside you will come into its full manifestation. And the, the end of the process is that harvest time when God 
brings that to completion. And so it's guaranteed the seed, praise God, it doesn't depend on you ultimately because the power's in the seed to make you like Christ. Hallelujah. Uh, 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 but we, we cooperate by just keeping our soil as good soil. All right. So that, that is a very, uh, going back to Mark chapter 4 now, you see, that's very encouraging to know that God's seed in us, God's word in us, has the power to produce the results. Praise God. We have to be patient. We have to be confident in the seed. We have to be patient in the seed. We have to believe in that seed um, rather than someone who just walks away and uh, doesn't believe the seed is, is, is working. But it will grow. God will give it the growth until the full manifestation takes place. Praise God. All right. The Word of God works mightily in us. All right. Now we go to... to Another one more parable, the parable of the mustard seed. And um, the mustard seed was the smallest seed, herbal seed, th that was used in the land of Israel. And um, Jesus in, in Luke uh, 17 6, we won't go there, but Luke 17 6 talks about if you have faith as a mustard seed. So, so the mustard seed is connected with faith. And he says, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Verse 30. Or with what parable shall we picture it? Now, there's a very good uh, definition of what a parable is. A parable, you see, is a pic that we want to understand a spiritual reality called the kingdom of God. And he says, a parable is used to picture it. In other words, a parable describes a natural thing that is a bit that is like the spiritual thing and so the parable pictures the kingdom of god and in this case he says in verse 31 it is like a mustard seed which when it is sown on the ground is smaller than all the seeds on earth now it it was the smallest seed in the land of israel that that they were used to working with um and it, and it's a tiny little thing and the, the point he's going to make is the contrast between this tiny seed and and the ultimately what the shrub that grows out of it is like a tree. And sometimes it's called a mustard tree. All right. Oh, it's really a shrub, but it the, a mustard tree could be 10 to 12 feet high just out of this tiny seed. That's that's what he's talking about. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Verse 31 which when it is sown on the ground is smaller than all the seeds on earth, verse 32, but when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs. It doesn't say it's the biggest tree on earth, it's, it's the biggest herb. Um, it's the b biggest of all the garden herbs. And it shoots out large branches, so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. So w what is Jesus saying here? Um, now, it's, it's interesting, in Scripture... And again, I'll just give you the references, Daniel 4.12, Ezekiel 31.6. Kingdoms are described in terms of trees, okay? Uh, uh, like Babylon and, or, and these other kingdoms, described like a large, strong tree that, um, you know, lots of peoples dwell in, can dwell in, like, like all these birds. And what he's saying here is the kingdom of God is going to start... The kingdom of God in this age is going to start from a seed. Now, the, and a very small seed at that, it, that would seem insignificant. Now, why would this be surprising to the disciples? Because they were expecting the messianic kingdom, which is, when, which is what Jesus will set up when he comes in power and glory and establishes his kingdom on the earth and it will be very dramatic and it will be full of outward manifestation um, but now he's saying the mystery kingdom will be altogether differently it will start just from a small seed and it will not now eventually there will be a great outward manifestation at the coming of the lord at harvest time but it will start from a very small seed and god's working in your life starts from a very small seed it's when god speaks to you 
for instance, when he spoke to me and, and called me. You know, it was just a, a deep inner voice, if you like, inner awareness of a calling, and then that began to to govern my whole life, you see. And, and so God's working in your heart starts from a little small seed, a vision, a, you know, and then it develops out from that into a bigger manifestation. And, and so this mustard seed, again, is compared to faith. So the kingdom of God actually began in one person, Jesus Christ. And he was the origin of this new faith community. He was the original mustard seed, as it were. And he was planted into the ground in his death and burial. And then he sprung up, you see. And out of this, this small mustard seed, he began, sprung up. And one by one, different ones had faith like a mustard seed. They had the same kind of faith. They put their trust in Jesus. And as they did, so this mustard tree began to grow. And this is a picture of the church. Those who put their trust in Jesus, those who have that f faith. And so this faith community called the church gr grows, grows bigger and bigger. And the prophecy is, even though it's a tiny seed, and then it, there was the, the few disciples, and then in the book of Acts, you see this, this tree growing and growing and, until now. The, the, the church of Jesus Christ is bigger than any kingdom on the earth, much bigger than, than Judaism now. You're talking about many, many people, maybe a billion people, who knows how many it is. Uh, you know, and I'm talking about the, tr the true believers. Uh, and and so this is this is a prophecy that has been fulfilled over two thousand years. That must this mustard tree of the church has grown very large, praise God, and um, from small beginnings. That that is a prophecy that has been fulfilled. And you are in that mustard tree if you are in Christ. You are joined organically to Christ, and you have that same kind of faith. Praise God. And it's interesting, the last detail of this, it says that it's so big that birds of the air nest under its shade. Literally it is that birds of the air pitch their tents in the tree. Now, in the parable of the sower, uh, Jesus talked about the birds or the fowls of the air in a negative sense. Um, he talked about, um, you know, somebody who doesn't really pay much attention to the word, it's the seed is is taken away by the birds of the air and so the birds of the air you could could refer to the agents of satan that whether demonic or human those who uh, you know who who speak against the word of god and steal the word of god from people's hearts who who don't who are not committed to it and so these birds are actually not believers he says the church will grow to a point where it actually will suit unbelievers or people who are not born again to actually dwell in the branches of the church. And, and I would always say, are you a bird or are you a branch? Because are you, do you have that living faith in Christ? You are joined to Christ or you are, you are just a bird who's, who's just sitting in the branches of the church, but you don't really belong. See, eventually a bird will get up and fly away because it's really not part of the tree. It might look like it is, but it's not. And so there are people who, for different reasons, are in the church and maybe, you know, even get their job from the church or they, 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 they get different benefits from the church, um, but they are not truly part of the church themselves. And this is what Jesus said, that as the church grows, there will be many birds, as it were, that will join in on the church. And in fact, you can, you can find whole denominations, whole branches of the church are, you know, are full of unbelievers, you know, because uh, certain denominations apostatize and uh, go away from the gospel. So this prophecy is fulfilled too. The birds and the branches. So make sure you're a branch joined to Jesus. You are in Christ. You abide in him.
praise God. All right, verse 33. Um, With many such parables, and many of more of them are given in Matthew, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. That's interesting, isn't it? It says that Jesus shares the word with you as you are able to hear it. Remember he said in the parable of the sower, you know, some some people uh, have a bigger capacity for receiving the word than others because it all depends on the value you give to the word of God that determines your ability to hear, to understand what he's saying to you. So the more you value the word of God, the more open your heart is and the more able he is able to teach you. So it says there, you see, he speaks the word of God to you as you are able to hear it. He, he's trying to get it to you. But your ability to hear it depends, again, on your how much attention and value you put on the word of God. Verse 34. But without a parable, he did not speak to them. Now, of course, Jesus didn't only use parables. But what he's saying is in the context, he's talking about the parables of the kingdom. The parables of that describe this mystery kingdom that um, he whenever he talked about the church age he did it through parables all right and when they were alone he explained all things to his disciples i love that so when he was talking to the crowds he would share these stories you see and that was to get them interested to get their attention all right they weren't necessarily ready to to receive the meat but they he intrigued them with these stories and they would go away thinking about what 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 did he mean by that and, and that would get them on a positive pro- process of inquiry and the disciples are like the ones that is a picture of those who are closer to him they choose to be closer to him and as we draw close to jesus we we ask him questions we say lord what, what do you mean by this what are you trying to say to me in my life and as you draw close to him in that way as a disciple then it says he will explain all things to you he will reveal those things to you if you have a heart to want to understand all right and now we get on to the the the, the training aspect um in verse 35 and and it's unusual for Mark to make a time notice. And he says, on the same day. On the same day. Now, when he says that, then that's important to understand that what happened now, and now we're going to have, in fact, uh, Matthew 5 is full of three major miracles of Jesus. And what we're going to see is a miracle of Jesus now. But it's connected to the teaching in Mark 4. That's why he said, on the same day now what's what's the connection here well basically one one connection is this was the day in which he gave the teaching about the word of god and and how the word of god works so now he's putting them to the test he's giving them a chance to put their faith into action this is a bit like an examination if you like because in many ways we only learn through experience you know, I might share the word with you now, but then the test is, you know, maybe tomorrow or next week, when you are in a situation where you need to put it into practice. And so now is the examination time. And so on the same day that he gave them the word and the principles they needed, now we're going to see, are they able to put that into practice? Praise God. And um, But there's another aspect to this on the same day i just want to draw out it's on the same day as the jewish rejection of jesus remember they accused him of being uh, possessed by satan and at that time in in parables he then went to teach the multitudes by the lakeside and this was a picture of him uh, a prophetic picture that now when israel reject him he is going to go to the gentiles and he is going to say let's just finish reading this verse verse 35 on the same day when evening had come he said to them let us evening again it represents the closing of a certain day and the opening of a new day and he's describing the opening of a new day which is what we call the church age where he is going to turn as it were from israel to the nations 
all right? And this is being acted out now. And what we're going to see is even Jesus' miracles are parables because they actually reveal. He uses them to teach spiritual lessons. And, and one of the lessons is going to be is, is what's going to happen in this, in this new church age. Because he says to them, let us cross over to the other side. That seems like an innocent comment. But you see, Jesus, they were on the west side of Galilee, which was Israelite territory. Now they are heading over to the other side. And what we're going to see in Mark 5 is that is that, that is Gentile territory. You see, because that's the story of the Gadarene demoniac when he meets this Gentile madman. And you remember he casts out the 5,000 demons and there's pigs there. And the pigs run down the cliff face into the sea. But Jew, Jewish territory would never have pigs. You see, that's, that's anathema to the Jews. So that's Gentile territory. So what Jesus is doing now in picture form, as it were, he, the Jew, Israel had rejected him. So this is a picture of what he's going to do in the church age. He is going to go over to the Gentile territory and bring the gospel to the Gentiles. And, and, the, and the word of God is going to go to the Gentiles. So that, that's why he emphasized it. On the same day that the Jews rejected him, he is now going to move into Gentile territory. But what we're going to see as well through this, through this story is that Satan is not pleased with that. Uh, Satan considered Gentile territory his, his domain. And when the gospel goes into Gentile territory, it's going to face opposition from the enemy. And, and all of this is going to be pictured in this story here, but, uh, but also is going to be pictured the victory that we have uh, in the name of Jesus over all the four powers of the enemy. All right, let's look at this wonderful miracle in verse 35. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. I want you to notice he gave them a word. He gave them the word of God, all right? And they, um, they should have understood, right, that's the word of God. And they, from his teaching, they should have said, right, we must value this. We, we must give attention to this. We must let this control our thoughts. Jesus said, he didn't say, let us go and let's drown halfway across the lake. He said, let us go to the other side. And if they would have embraced that word and valued it, then, then even when they're going to face a storm in a minute, they would have the word in their heart and they would not fall into fear because they would be trusting in his word because Jesus had said this. And therefore, they would have peace through the storm, through trusting in, the, in his word. Let us go to the other side. But sadly, we're going to see they failed the test. They weren't good soil. They quickly let go of the word. As soon as pressure came on them, you know, like the second soil, as soon as pressure came on them, they, they forgot about what Jesus said, and they're in panic mode. They're fearful, you see. And, and so... Let us go to the other side. That's the word that they should have clung on to. Now they're going to be tested to see if they really believe that word. See, God gives you words, but there will always be a test from the world as to whether you will truly believe and hold on to that word through the trial. All right, so let's see what happens. Verse 36. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, so Jesus is now in the boat, um, and other little boats or boats were also with him. Verse 37, and a great windstorm arose. So they, imagine them, they're halfway across, and suddenly a great windstorm arose. And this is a bit like a hurricane, you know, this is a really strong word that's used and this can happen on the lake of galilee you can what what can it's in a kind of um it's below sea level and it's surrounded by mountains and then there's the the jordan valley at one end and what can suddenly happen is uh, a, a strong wind can be channeled onto the lake that cuts through through the hills surrounding it and suddenly out of nowhere this storm broke brews up but we're going to see from Jesus' reaction that this was, this was a supernatural storm. 
Jesus was heading into enemy territory uh, to deliver this demoniac. And um, Satan was trying to stop them. Satan sent this storm. You know, some storm, some, sometimes we think storms happen when we've done something wrong. Not necessarily. Sometimes you're doing absolutely the right thing. They are in the will of God and a storm comes down. Just because you're in a storm doesn't mean you've missed God's will, all right? It could be that you're on the right track, but the enemy's trying to oppose you. He's trying to distract you. And so a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. I want you to notice there are two problems here. There is the wind, all right, uh, and there is the waves. Now, the obvious problem is the waves getting into the boat and filling the boat, all right? Um, causing, because if, if that water gets in the boat, it's going to start to sink. So that's a, the obvious problem. But I want you to notice what's causing these waves is the wind, all right? So what's the main problem? Well, they're both major problems, the wind and the waves, all right? And these were experienced sailors, fishermen. But they were in a panic. This was probably the worst storm they've ever seen because it, it had a satanic element to it. And this is a picture for us, you see. There's two, the opposition, the, the trial in our life has two components, the wind and the waves. The wind is the spiritual forces at work. All right, sometimes there are spiritual forces coming against us. And those spiritual forces actually cause physical manifestations that's the waves you see so they're being attacked by the wind and the waves the the spiritual and and the natural you see and um that's a picture of us on the boat of life we're trying doing god's will jesus says go to the other side but then a storm hits how are we going to handle that storm and this is what jesus was training them in because what they would learn in this example would really help them later on as they start moving out and share the gospel to 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 the Gentiles, um, they would use these faith lessons from this miracle, and so you have the wind and the waves, and the boat was was filling up. Um, what about Jesus? Verse verse thirty eight. But he was in the stern, and that means the back the back of the ship. The bow is at the front. The stern is at the back. Asleep on a pillow. Now, it's not a nice, comfy pillow that, that we think about. This would have been like a leather seat at, at the back that, that he could just probably roll up and uh, have a sleep on. And, and it's interesting. This is the only example in the Bible where it talks about Jesus sleeping. But it reminds us that he was human. He was human like us. He just had a monster day, all right? He had been, um, did, a, did miracles. He had done hours and hours of teaching. Um, he, uh, and now, you know, he is exhausted. He, he is, he's asleep on the pillow. And it tells us that he, he was human like the rest, you know, like anyone. He needed his rest. Um, but also it tells us that he was, in faith all right it was the sleep as it were of the the trusting believer because he believed god's word that they were going to go to the other side and so because he had the, god's promise he was able to rest he was able to sleep so here's jesus asleep on the pillow and they awoke him and said to him teacher do you not care that we're perishing now in the other gospel accounts in I think the other one is like Mark, uh, Matthew 8 and Luke 8. Um, they, they say, Lord, save us. We're perishing. D don't you know we're perishing? But here, Mark brings out the fact that they actually also rebuke Jesus. Can you imagine? Do you not care that we are perishing? So it is very annoying, isn't it, when you're in a troubling situation and, and this person that you're with seems to be oblivious to it uh, and smiling away and 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 you think don't, don't you care and and it's kind of this was their this showed their unbelief you see the the basic problem in their reaction is unbelief they didn't trust in jesus or in his word 
They didn't trust that Jesus cared for them, that he was going to look after them. And he di they didn't trust his word, which is they're going to go to the other side. So as soon as the outward situation looks bad, they immediately, because they, they have this unbelief, they get into fear. And now they're upset with Jesus because he's sleeping. It seems like he's relaxed. He, it seems like he doesn't care. You know, sometimes you can go through a bad situation and, and you can, your flesh will want to say, God, where are you? Why don't you care about me? Aren't, aren't you concerned about me? You're, you're letting me go through this, you know? And, and that is unbelief. That's the reaction of unbelief. You're acting as if God doesn't care. You should know by faith God does love you. God gave his son to die for you. God, God does care for you. All right, that should be a given. So this reaction is, in fact, they rebuke Jesus, but Jesus will rebuke them at the end for their unbelief. Um, of course, we should know whatever we're going through, God loves you. God cares for you. All right. And God is going to see you through this. All right. God never promised you an easy journey. All right. He, but he promised that he will get you to your destination in the end. All right. But he promised that he will be with you in that journey and he will help you and they should have come to 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 jesus saying you know master you know we got a problem i know you but i we, we trust you that you're going to get us through this and we trust your word that we're going to the other side so they gave him lip service you know they said teacher rabbi you're our teacher but actually they're not putting his teaching into practice you see had they received the word, they would have responded in faith. But, but they are responding in fear because of unbelief. All right. And now Jesus stands up and verse 39. Then he arose, stood up, praise God, from a deep sleep and rebuked the wind. Now, notice there's two problems, the wind and the waves. What Jesus dealt with did was he went to the cause of the problem. All right, what was the cause? The obvious manifestation of the promise problem was the waves, the physical stuff that's going on in our life. But Jesus discerned that behind the waves is the wind, which is the spiritual, the spiritual attack. And so it says he rebuked the wind. And the interesting thing is this word for rebuke is exactly the same word that's used for rebuking demons. All right, he when he rebuked demons. So I believe this, this indicates that the wind was satanic in origin. All right, Not everything that bad that happens to you is because there's a demon involved, obviously. Just because your fridge breaks down doesn't mean there's a demon got in, which is, you know, silly. But sometimes, and, and you, you will, you, God will show you when there's a problem manifesting, it's demonic in origin. And then you need to rebuke the wind. You need to rebuke that evil spirit, just like Jesus did. And so he rebuked the wind. He took authority over the wind and told it to stop right now, in Jesus' name. <laughs> and, and then, having rebuked the wind, he then spoke to the sea. You see, having rebuked the spiritual force behind the problem, the next thing you should do is speak to the physical circumstances. All right, Speak to your body. Speak to your bank account. Speak to, you know, the physical situation. And say, peace, be still. And this word peace, really, I think, is mean, shh, be quiet, silence. Be still is in the kind of um, present tense, which means shut your mouth and stay silent. In other words, he commanded the waves to, um, to stop immediately. And both the wind and the waves obeyed him. First of all, it says, and the wind ceased. So immediately he spoke the command, the wind stopped. Now normally what would happen is the sea would, start ch would still churn, you know, for half an hour or whatever, and gradually settle down. But in this case, it says there was a great calm. So the wind stopped immediately. And also the sea immediately became calm. There were two miracles here, the wind and the waves, both obeying Jesus. 
And what Jesus did, of course, is he put his own teaching into practice. He had received a word from God that they were going to the other side. And he believed that word. He, in the midst of a storm, he still had faith, confidence, peace in his heart. And then he came against the enemy. And in faith, he commanded the work of the enemy to stop in Jesus' name. And then he spoke to his circumstances to come into peace praise god and jesus was demonstrating you know how we are meant to operate in trials and tribulations we don't get into a panic um based on unbelief and fear but we we stand strong on the word of god and we speak the word of god and we rebuke the operation of the enemy so this was like a kind of um this was like a, a, a practical, you know, example to to the disciples, because what what he was also teaching them. This is a picture of the church age, and from very early Christian times, a, a church, one of the pictures of the church is a boat. You see, this is a picture of the of the church, all right, and God sending the church on a mission. And the, what it says is Jesus is in the midst of his church, in the boat. Praise God. He is, goes with us as we go. All right? And, and there will be opposition from the enemy. And there will be storms that we will face in this church age because the enemy is still active. And uh, the important thing about the two kinds of attacks against the church is the wind and the waves. Now, with the wind in Scripture is particularly applied to false doctrines. One kind of attack that the devil sends against the church is false doctrine. That's the winds of doctrine. But also, the waves, the waves of the world getting into the church, that's the other attack. And right now, there are all kinds of waves getting into the church. You see, the, the, the church is meant to be in the world, uh, but the world is not meant to be in the church. All right, because the ship is meant to be in the sea, but the sea is not meant to be in the ship. Otherwise, it's going to sink. And if a church allows the, as it were, the worldliness of the world, the waves of the world, as it were, the values of the world to, to fill it, it will sink. Uh, and so we have to, we have to keep, we, we, we need to come against the false doctrines and the wrong spiritual forces that are trying to work and we also need to keep keep the waves the the world out out of the church you see and and we will fulfill our mission so he gave them this practical lesson although they failed it they failed the exam they would remember this because this would have inspired their faith that jesus when they go through a future storm jesus is with them and then they, they would have learnt from this experience how to handle it. All right. So we're almost there. Um, it says in verse 39 that the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, now is, is the kind of um, what we call the debrief. You know, they've taken the exam. Now they're getting their, their marks back. And, and basically <laughs> they didn't get very many marks. He said to them, why are you so fe fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And again, the basis of fear is unbelief. Because they didn't believe God's, his, in Jesus, in his power to save them, and they didn't believe in his promise to go to the other side, they were in unbelief. And when you're in unbelief, you're controlled by whatever's happening around you. And unbelief produces fear. Because the only thing that will protect your heart from fear is faith. You see, when you believe in God's word, that God's going to see you through this, that God's more powerful than your problem, then that protects your heart from fear. But when unbelief takes over your heart, then whatever bad stuff happens, you're immediately into fear. So notice what he says. Why are you so fearful? And he basically gave the answer. How is it that you have no faith? The basis for their fear was their, the, the fact that their faith was very shallow in another gospel it says they had little faith 
All right. Here, even, he says they have no faith. Well, they had some faith. But the problem was, faith comes by the word of God, and they hadn't given value to the word sufficiently for that word to be very strongly rooted in their heart. So they, they had little faith, and as soon as the test came, the unbelief took over. All right, because the word was not rooted strongly in them. So that was the the root of their problem, was their little faith. Their little, they hadn't really given attention to the word of God so that it was rooted in them, so that they were committed to the word of God. And as a result, when the test came, they were full of fear rather than full of faith. How is it? So he, he pointed the finger to the problem. This was a test of their faith and the test of their, their, the grip that they had on the word of God, and, and they failed that test. He said, that, that was your problem. All right? But they would learn from that. And even through this, their faith was greatly uh, increased. Notice the final verse of our study, verse 41. And they feared exceedingly. Now, this word for fear is really awe and wonder and reverence. And, and one of the um, aspects of a miracle is that it creates wonder or reverence or fear. There's, we talk about signs and wonders. The effect of a miracle, one effect, is wonder. It's awe, reverence. In other words, when, a, when Jesus do, do, did a miracle, now they immediately ask, Who is this man? All right, let's read it. He, they said to one another, Who can this be? Or what manner of man can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Notice, the, both the wind and the sea obeyed him. And, and so they are, they, they are in fear, the fear of the Lord, the, the reverence. Now, who is this man? I mean, they already knew, you see, that Jesus was, uh, had dominion over demons and sicknesses but this was a new thing that de that jesus was also lord over nature the lord of creation because in the jewish thinking really only god could control nature and the elements and here is a man as it were acting like god and and they are wondering who is this man they, they are beginning to to realize oh, this jesus is bigger than who we imagined him to be uh, they may not be there yet, but eventually they're going to find out. He's the God man, you see. Uh, he, he is. Um, in fact, let me just take you to one verse here in Proverbs 30, verse 4. Proverbs 30, verse 4 really applies nicely to, to, to this. But again, faith is being created in the heart. You see, they thought, you know, Jesus was impressive in many ways. But now they discovered that he controls the wind and the waves. That's that's very godlike, and and now they're they're in amazement, and they're beginning. It's beginning to dawn on them that if Jesus can do that, Jesus is strong enough for any situation, whatever situation they're going to go through, whatever storm they're going to go through. Jesus is greater than that. He can control creation. He can control the the whole situation. And so their their faith in Jesus is getting bigger, and eventually they will realize Jesus is the God-man. All right, uh, what did I say? Proverbs 34. Um, excuse me while I find it. Here we go. Almost there. Okay. Who has ascended into heaven or descended? Because that's talking about Jesus. Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who controls the wind? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who controls the waters? And of course the answer is God. Who has established all the ends of the earth? God. What is his, his name? God. And here's an interesting one. What is his son's name? If you know. And there's a hint that God has a son. And his name is Jesus. And he descended from heaven and he ascended from heaven. He's the God-man.
praise God. And he is the one that controls the wind and the waves. And so when they saw this demonstration of his power over nature, over creation, this they begin to dawn on them. This is the God man. This what manner of man is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. So God used this situation to build their faith in him. So that when again they're in another situation, they've received his word, they've received his promise, but Satan is opposing. They're in a storm. Perhaps that's you right now. They are to learn the parable from this miracle that Jesus is in the boat with you. You are not to be afraid. Trust in his word. He is with you. He's going to bring you through to the other side. And by faith in his word, you can speak the word. You can speak the end result. I am going to the other side. And I rebuke the wind. I rebuke every spiritual force coming against me. And I, come, I speak to my body. I speak to my circumstances. Peace, be still. I'm going to the other side in the name of Jesus. And the, for that to work, you've got to get the word in your heart. You've got to give the word first place in your life well that brings us to the end of chapter four next time we're going to get into chapter five it's a wonderful chapter because um, that we've covered there really the main teaching aspect in mark's gospel mark four most of mark is is full of stories and miracles and so on chapter five we're going to see three more classic miracles of jesus showing that he is lord over the, over demons he is lord over sickness and he's even lord over death and we're going to see those miracles in mark chapter 5 well god bless you amen <music>